Well, first to the action on the last street where the bulls showed resilience, staging a sharp recovery after an early slump. However, the Sensex and the Nifty still closed the day in the red, but the losses were not steep and nothing in comparison to the kind of global sell-off that we saw overnight. Bank stocks led the recovery with the Nifty Bank Index ending at a lifetime high, and that sums up the market action for the day. In the money market, the rupee weakening against the dollar, U.S. inflation data led to a rally in the dollar index as investors placed bets on the Fed, tightening its monetary policy even further. The rupee remains below the 80 mark against the greenback. Meanwhile, India's 10-year bond prices also dropped. The yields went up in trade today. On the macro front, India's wholesale price index has eased to 12.4% in August versus 13.9% in July. The reading is also lower than our expectation of a 13% rise. However, the index continues to remain in double digits for the 17th consecutive month. Food and vegetable inflation rose month on month, while fuel and power witnessed a 10% dip month on month. Staying with inflation in the UK, inflation has eased to 9.9%, breaking a year of upward momentum on the back of lower fuel prices. The August reading is lower than July, when inflation had peaked to a 40-year high of just over 10%. These figures are also better than expectations of a 10.2% rise. The big CNBC TV 18 exclusive newsmaker tonight. Vedanta's chairman Anil Agarwal expects the company's joint venture with Foxconn to start commercial operations in two years. Vedanta and Foxconn will come together to manufacture semiconductors in Gujarat. Speaking exclusively to me, Agarwal said that investments will come from the group's listed entity. Vedanta will hold 62% stake in the joint venture. Foxconn will hold the remaining, the remaining stake. Vedanta will also set up a display glass unit that will develop a hub for mobiles and laptops. That's the hope and the aspiration that India can become a hub for mobile and laptop manufacturing. And if that happens, Maharashtra could possibly be a destination, but Vedanta by itself is not going to be getting into the manufacturing business of either mobile phones or laptops. Will any uh, funding for this joint venture come from the listed entity from Vedanta? Yes, it will be part of Vedanta Limited. And this is the part of Vedanta uh, Indian company, which will be one of the subsidiary, will be executing this project. So could you give us some uh, estimate of the kind of funding that will come from the listed entity, sir, for this project to be taken forward? Yes, and the um, uh, debt will come, uh, equity will come from this, and debt, debt we will take from the market. When will we move closer uh, to starting the work on the ground now that uh, uh, you know the decision has been made uh, in terms of Gujarat being the location? Uh, what about any further approvals that are required both from the central government to ensure that you can get started? What are the timelines that we're looking at? All the approvals are in place and they all are doing the uh, final thing. But parallelly, we are looking two years time that we should have the product to be out in the market. Well, in two years, the product should be out in the market. That's Anil Agarwal, and you can catch more of that interview with him at 9.30pm right here on CNBC TV18. Prime Minister Modi is all set to release the national logistics policy later this week. It aims to reduce the high logistics costs for Indian companies. Sources say the policy intends to bring logistics costs lower and in line with global benchmarks by 2030 and create a single point of reference for all logistics and trade facilitation. Food Secretary Sudhanshu Pandey has defended India's decision to restrict rice exports. He said intervention was necessary as broken rice export had spiked by an abnormal 4,200% between April and August. That's not all. He also said that India has been very responsible and that rice exports this year will be 17% higher than last year. He also said that India exported 21 lakh metric tons of wheat before the regulations. But post the regulations of the curbs, India has in fact exported 24 lakh metric tons of wheat to governments using the G2G route. Take a look. The global supply chains across the world, they have got disrupted and many countries who used to be traditional exporter of uh, broken rice along with India, uh, they have not been supplying that quantity and in, as a result of which uh, the entire push was coming from India. When this price hike uh, also became very abnormal and therefore this intervention uh, became absolutely necessary. Uh, we had uh, exported about uh, 21 lakh metric ton of wheat 
and after the regulation we have exported about 24 lakh metric ton of wheat so uh, why am and so far we have exported about uh, 44 45 lakh metric ton of wheat india has been very responsible and despite regulations we had kept certain windows open to take care of all vulnerable countries all our neighbors and figures very clearly reflect that all those requirements have been very carefully met well that is the food secretary saying that for now the government believes that further intervention is not required by way of restrictions or bans on any food commodity. Shares of Amuja cement surging more than 7%, hitting an all-time high after the company said that the board will meet on the 16th of September to consider fundraising. The cement company, however, has not disclosed the amount of funds it is looking to raise. The Department of Revenue Intelligence is seeking to recover 330 crore rupees from Hero Electric for allegedly evading customs duty. The DRAI had sent a show cause notice to the company in December 2020 after claiming that the company imported e-bikes and e-scooters fully assembled and declared them as automobile parts. The government has already stopped the flow of subsidies to Hero Electric under the FAME scheme. Responding to CNBC TV 18's query, Hero Electric said that the company is compliant with the law, adding that it has been granted a stay order and no duties have been paid. Parikshit joins us now to take us through the details. Parikshit, what is the DRAI's contention? What are the chief allegations being made? So it now is clear that Hero Electric is the subject of two investigations that have taken place. Uh, the FAME 2 in investigation that has been conducted by the DHI, their uh, subsidies were suspended because they were not meeting domestic value addition criteria and there were discrepancies with that data. We've been told that their subsidies were stopped three months ago and subsidies for them in Okinawa continue to be under suspension for the moment. DHI is also taking the help of other agencies in in identifying uh, uh, lapses by these two companies and other EV players as well. Simultaneously, we've also come to know that the DREI conducted investigations into imports by Hero Electric between 2009 to 2014 and 2017 to 2019. These were of low-speed electric two-wheelers, according to our source in the government. We've accessed the uh, show cause notice which was issued to Hero Electric and that has strong words. It goes on to say that Hero Electric committed a fraud intentionally after proper planning and modus operandi and uh, they uh, the agency, the DRI, would like to recover dues of 330 crores because there has been a strong violation of customs duties. Essentially, uh, CKD kits were ordered, but they were bifurcated. Parts were sent to different ports for delivery. So the DRI believes that they have misled the state uh, st system willfully and misrepresented facts. And that's why 330 crores must be recovered from Hero Electric. Now, this show cause dates back to December 2020. Hero Electric is saying this is three and a half years old. Uh, we have challenged this in court. We have got a stay order. DRI says that they will be defending this uh, case in court. But uh, clearly, there are uh, certain issues uh, that Hero Electric is facing with regard to domestic value addition, with regard to uh, its import supply chain as well. And some of these questions are there for other electric vehicle makers in the market as well. They are facing scrutiny by different agencies, especially the Ministry of Heavy Industry. Parikshit, many thanks for joining us and taking us through the details of that story. Revenue Secretary Tarun Bajaj is expecting GST revenue collections to cross 1.5 lakh crore rupees in October. So far, monthly collections have remained robust but just shy of that number and he's hoping that ahead of the festive season, we can see a bump up. For the last uh, couple of months, we have been trying very hard to clinch or to reach that milestone of 1.5 lakh crores. But we have been failing a bit, sometimes by 2,000, sometimes by 6,000 crores. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Jory, the CBIC will promise us that, okay, we'll give them some time. We are already in the middle of September. Say the revenues that we'll collect in October and the, um, the result of which will come on the 1st of November, I'm sure from that month onwards, CB, CBIC on a regular basis shall deliver 1.5 lakh revenue for the government of India. Well, that is Tarun Bajaj, the Revenue Secretary. On to the auto sector, Maruti Suzuki is upbeat about its strong booking trend ahead of the festive season. The company's executive director, Shashank Srivastav, told us that they anticipate a strong season provided that production is as per demand. The company has over 4 lakh pending bookings. 
We have seen a strong uh, booking trend so far. Um, and uh, going forward in the festive season, I expect the festive season to be strong. Uh, provided, of course, that uh, we are able to produce vehicles uh, according to the underlying demand pattern. There is a lot of uh, pending bookings uh, at the OEMs across the industry and also at Maruti Suzuki. We have uh, about 425,000 bookings which are pending. So I expect the uh, season to be strong. Indian retailers are seeing strong sales growth across categories with August sales rising by 15% over the pre-COVID levels. Retailers remain bullish about sales picking up ahead of the festive season. E-commerce giant Amazon asserts that seller and consumer sentiment remains positive, while Vijay sales remains upbeat about the consumer durables sector. Take a look. Looking at uh, the August month, so Ganesh Chaturthi never is a very big sale month anymore. For the last four or five years. But what we saw on August 15th was a phenomenal growth over even 2019 and even uh, over last year. So looking at that, we are very bullish, at least in consumer durable, that we should be seeing a very good Diwali. September is not going to be a very key month to be observed. Sentiment among sellers is very positive. The consumer sentiment is also very positive. Um, uh, we believe uh, this Diwali will be better than last year for the last nine years every diwali has been bigger than the previous one I, and i think it's just the flywheel of sellers and consumers which uh, makes the marketplace move faster correct uh, you already had about two sales already that went by for in, around independence day then your great indian festival so what is the kind of response that you got in those two sales and what does that tell you about this festive season uh, can you give me any rough figures or trends that you saw in those sales so we don't get into numbers in terms of, but like I said, what is most important for me is um, getting those 11 lakh sellers successful. Um, the number of sellers who become karorpatis, the number of new sellers who unenroll, and then of course our ability to delight the customers. Well, the market mood ahead of the festive season. Ed tech company Baiju's has seen its losses in FY21 surge past 4,500 crore rupees. This is 19 times more than what the losses were in FY20. Revenue has also declined and it's declined by about 3%. There has been a change in revenue recognition, which is what the company is saying. And that has been done on account of advice from their auditors. Andhati Ramanan is here to take us through the details. That's right, Baiju's has come out with its numbers for FY21 after a year-long wait and here's how the numbers stack up. In a conversation with Money Control, Baiju Ravindran said that the EdTech Unicorn's revenues came in at over 2,400 crore rupees, which was a 3% fall when compared to the previous year. However, the company saw a loss of over 4,500 crore rupees, which is a surge of over 19 times when compared to a loss of 231 crore rupees in the previous year. Meanwhile, Baiju told Money Control that due to a change in accounting practices, a significant increase in business was not reflected in the revenue figure and nearly 40% of the revenue was deferred to subsequent years. Baiju's Ravindran said, and I quote, During COVID, we gave streaming access to a lot of our users because of shipment delays and that had to be changed. The revenue had to be recognized across the period of consumption. And he added that secondly, on account of credit sales, EMI sales, recognition was based on significant collection of that. Revenue was recognized after the completion of collection. And these were the two additional changes that had to be made. End of quote. Remember, Baiju's financial results drew a lot of attention as it was delayed at least four times. The reason for which Ravindran said was due to three factors. First, on account of the fact that the company was unable to travel due to COVID, delaying the audit of some of the companies it acquired. He also stated that the complexity of the acquisitions, as well as the change in revenue recognition that Deloitte requested, caused the delay in filing the results. In the interview with Money Control, Baiju Ravindran said that if this can't break us, nothing will. End of quote. Well, now, these were the FI21 numbers. When will the FI22 numbers come out? The company is not in a hurry. Ravindran continued to tell Money Control, and I quote, we have not decided that yet. Investors and lenders don't care. And speaking objectively, not a single investor has sold their shares in the last six months, while some of them are sitting on 50x or 100x returns End of quote. Well, I don't understand how investors don't care. But anyway, uh, that's uh, that's the news coming in from Baiju's releasing its numbers after a long gap. A quick check of the headlines. Less than 20 hours to go before crypto network Ethereum institutes its biggest software update to date. Major cryptocurrencies and tokens like Bitcoin have taken a beating ahead of the merger, which is being seen as a potential threat to the minor business models and the ESG ranking of investors.
A court at the European Union has upheld the antitrust penalty imposed on Google over the Android operating system. The court has trimmed the penalty, though, from $4.3 billion to $4.1 billion. IT companies are increasingly concerned about their employees moonlighting or taking up other jobs after working hours. Speaking against the practice, Infosys in an email has warned employees about severe consequences if they are found violating the code of conduct. The company said, and I quote, no two-timing, no moonlighting and no double lives. Any violation could lead to termination of employment, end of quote. The warning from Infosys comes days after Wipro chairman Rishad Premji in a tweet had called moonlighting in the tech industry as I, and I quote, as cheating, plain and simple. Global tech giant IBM has spoken up against the dual employment practice. Responding to a question by CNBC TV 18, IBM India's managing director Sandeep Patel agreed with the views of Premji. He said moonlighting is unethical for employees. You know Rishad's position on this, right? I share Rishad's position. In IBM, um, all of our employees, when they are employed, they sign an agreement which says that they are going to be working full-time for IBM. So notwithstanding what people can do with the rest of their time, it's not ethically right to do that. That's my position. Now, um, and you've, you've, you've heard the industry position on it, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that. Well, that's IBM saying no to moonlighting. Time for us to head into a break, but up next, brands continue to look beyond cricket, tennis and chess, gaining traction. That and more when we get back in a CNBC TV 18 special report.